So I'm going to move now into functional brain um, and then kind of leave some time for questions. So it's very similar in the brain. Um, it's um, actually a little bit, in my mind, easier in the brain because there's a much more spread out area, much more well-defined um, structures in the brain um, that, that can be um, affected. But really the key to the brain is the accuracy, the reproducibility and the accuracy. The two things that really led to the advancements in, in the use of electricity in the brain, neuromodulation, uh, functional neurosurgery, is accuracy of delivery of whatever we want to do, and then understanding of the circuitry and how it interacts so that you know where to go for the most part to get what you want to do. And you know, the first stereotactic uh, frame was by Horsley and Clark in 1908. The first human apparatus you can see here really Spiegel and Weiss were the, were the ones who really turned this into intracranial targeting, mapping, and they used pneumoencephalograms to develop their atlas um, and, and tie that all together. Um, Lars Lexell further improved the frame so that it was um, target-centered. And, and really, that's the key to a lot of this, is being accurate to your target within submillimeter accuracy but being able to have the flexibility to move your trajectory to avoid important structures, sinuses, arteries, veins, sulci, ventricles, things like that. Um, in general, when you do do um, intracranial um, excursions through the brain for um, anything, whether it's um, any kind of device in the brain, but particularly for stimulation, we want to avoid going through any peel surfaces. So you want to kind of go in through the cortex, through a peel surface, but stay within the uh, brain tissue to your target. So going in through sulci, going through ventricles just increases your risk of bleeding because that's a very vascular rich area. So in general, um, you know, just entering through the cortex at your entry point and staying outside of peel surfaces other than that, is the ideal um, trajectory. And that's truly what Lars Lexell made possible, made, making this a target-centered um, device that, that also makes it easier to calculate from, but allowed you the flexibility to pick where you wanted to go. So you could um, change the angle, change the entry point, and it was really, that was a major revolution in getting this done safely. Um, just like I talked about earlier um, with lesioning, Lesioning was um, in the brain as well as um, in the spinal cord where we started with treating, um, treating disorders. And again, a lot of it was serendipitous. It was, um, you know, of a stroke in the lenticular striate vasculature leading to improvement in tremors from Parkinson's disease or um, and just about any other discovery was usually an accidental thing. Um, obesity with um, you know, hypothalamic tumors, things like that. Those the discoveries of, of, you know, all of the, the functions of a lot of the structures in the brain were mostly uh, serendipitous through um, accidental discoveries. Um, but then as those nuclei, as those areas of, um, so that the, the, the center of where you wanted to, the center of where all the circuitry comes together were discovered, then people would start lesioning and, and they would get some benefit. But again, in the brain, just like in the spinal cord, more so in the brain, because a lot of times those diseases are progressive and evolutionary uh, because none of these things that we're doing are cures. They're mostly, they're all just to improve function. Um, the, the lesioning would have an effect at the time, but then it would go away. And that's what was found a lot of times with lesioning in the pallidum initially followed by the thalamus later for Parkinson's disease is that it would help for a while, but then the symptoms would come back. As lesioning went on, people started saying, well, let's be sure we're in the right spot before we make the lesion. So we know we did all the planning with the CAT scan or the MRI or really early on the pneumoencephalogram, but, but how do we know we're in the right spot? Because you can't actually see it when you're in there. So what they would do then is 
through the lesioning on lecto, they would put a little bit of um, electric current in there to see if they could get a temporary benefit. And a lot of these were all done awake. So if they got the benefit they were looking for with the electrical stimulation, they would know they're in the right spot and they would go ahead and make the lesion. Um, so that, that was kind of how it went. Lesioning was very, very popular right up until the um, 1960s when um, L-Dopa was discovered. And, and, you know, there's the movie with Robin Williams, Awakening, where, you know, there's all of these people that were essentially comatose in the... Um, in their beds, in in um, infirmaries and, and homes for people like that, and then L-Dopa, they started giving L-Dopa. They were up, they were walking. It was kind of a Lazarus effect. So that was such a miraculous drug that lesioning went away for probably about twenty years while the the L-Dopa was so effective. And then they, that started showing the effects we see now, which is there's a time dependent benefit for that where you start needing more and more and get more and more side effects then it loses its efficacy over time so, but for about 20 years there was um there was kind of a dip in lesioning and, and the medications were the thing but then right around that time there was a lot of technological advances in between there there was some um in the late 70s there was more focus on stimulation in the brain and what did that do and and some technologies, devices that were made smaller and safer. And then Dr. Benabede in Grenoble, France, was really the first one in the mid 80s to take the concept of if stimulation works before lesioning, why don't we just do that continuously? And then started working with companies to develop that kind of thing. And, and, and really Medtronic, Medtronic was a pioneer in pacemaker technology with electrical stimulation that it was kind of a 20 year journey that went from stimulating, you know, a pacemaker having a, a whole cart that carried all the mechanisms and the batteries that went around with the patient to make it an implantable device. And they kind of took the technology they had for pacemakers, made it a little bit more, um, made the electrode a little bit smaller and a little more brain friendly than, than you would for heart devices. And then worked with Dr. Benaby to really start taking an electrode put it in, in the brain um, that would stay there, not be inflammatory, not be destructive, connected to a, a generator very similar, almost exactly the same as what they use for the pacemaker, and then change the parameters and do that. And Dr. Benaby really pioneered that, um, that kind of technology. And, um, and really, a lot of that work was built, again, out of lesioning and animal models, and then creating a Parkinson's model and testing the DBS. And that, that was really a, a big, uh, big driver of getting that approved. Um, so a lot of animal model studies to test it out, test the theory out, and then get to humans. But again, with deep brain stimulation in particular, because it's non-destructive and adaptable, it really does give the um, give benefit, um, benefit that, that makes it safer to test with. So really, 87 is when Dr. Benaby did this first. By 1991, it, it was FDA approved. Deep brain stimulation was FDA approved in the U.S. for unilateral ventro-intermediate thalamic placement for essential tremor. Um, the trouble with that, and that was really good, but it took off really well. The trouble with it was it's nice to have one hand that works, but but there's about 20% of your fibers that cross over. So you still don't get the full benefit without bilateral stem. Plus it's usually a bilateral progressive disease. So with, within about two more years, it got FDA approved for bilateral placement and um, subthalamic placement for Parkinson's disease. And then by 2001, it, it got a humanitarian device exemption for dystonia, which, which just means you have to have an FDA uh, sponsored study kind of thing in your institution to do it. But those were the three main indications by 2001 that were really taken off. But there was about a 10 year run of Parkinson's and essential tremor that really got, got this to be kind of a mainstay. And initially deep brain stimulation was at the very end of the treatment algorithm because it was brain surgery and people thought it was more dangerous than drugs. But actually, what we found was that actually there was, it was safer than, than the medications after a certain point. And it's gradually moved down into the treatment algorithm so that at this point, 
in, in, in most practices, if you're taking medications more than three times a, a day, and still have breakthrough symptoms or limited by dyskinetic side effects is something to consider if you've had the disease for more than about three years, because you want to make sure it's not a rapidly progressive Parkinson's uh, type of thing um, where that wouldn't be beneficial. So three years of having the disease, taking medicines more than about three times a day and still having side effects, you're kind of a, you're a good candidate to at least talk about it. And so it's definitely moved down on the treatment algorithm. And what we found is that that helps keep people more functional because if we catch them earlier before they get more debilitated, they stay functional longer. There's also some evidence to suggest that, um, that this, by catching it earlier, it can actually slow down the progression of the disease. It's still not clear that's accurate because it may be just that because as the disease progresses and the electrodes in place where, you know, controls all of that area, just by changing the, um, electrode combinations, the pulse width or the frequency in the generator, you can recapture symptoms. And when you recapture symptoms, that may seem like the disease isn't progressing. But when you turn the stimulator off, it is progressing. So that's, that's where there's a little confusion of whether it slows down the progression or it's just the fact that it's in there and it can keep the symptoms well controlled even as the disease progresses. That's why that's not clear. Um, but, but, but the beauty of it is there are over 64,000 different combinations of settings in that little microprocessor that you can set with the electrode and make, and essentially what, what we do, I talked about it a little bit earlier is depending on the electrode combinations, the voltage or current makes that coverage area longer through the nucleus. So the electrode goes through the long axis of the nucleus. So it makes it longer through the nucleus is the voltage or current. The amplitude makes it, wider, and then uh, the frequency determines which electrode, which neurons you're stimulating. So, um, so you can really shape it to get what you want to get controlled and get really good benefit that way. Um, there, you know, most of what we, what we do is invasive stimulation. Transcranial magnetic stimulation has really taken off particularly in the last two years in the psychiatry world, it's got a better than 70% improvement rate or cure rate with, with um, medication resistant depression. So um, psychologists and psychiatrists are using transmagnetic stimulation for depression in a very big way these days. We, we don't generally do that. That's more in the psych world. Ours is more of the invasive type of neuromodulation. Um, at this point, um, you know, to bring it all together, there's a bunch of different type of stimulation um, technologies and uses. So there's deep brain stimulation with a bunch of uses, and I'll talk about a couple of those in a minute. There's spinal cord stimulation, which we talked about. Another advance in the spinal cord pain area is dorsal root ganglion stimulation. And then peripheral nerve stimulation is more of a further out end type stimulation where you put the stimulator right on the peripheral nerve, like I talked about with the occipital nerve. Sacral nerve stimulation for GI uh, issues. We talked about intrathecal pumps. Uh, vagal nerve stimulation. That's another one that, that the science, the actual science of how it works isn't very clear, but the studies show that it does with continuous stimulation improve um, Epilepsy um, symptomatology in particular, <coughs> seizure decrease, but also it has had some role in uh, depression. Neuropace is the epilepsy implantable um, closed loop system. That's the one closed loop system that we have. And you can see in the lower right corner, the picture of the Neuropace device, the processor itself is um, a part of the skull is carved out and that processor goes in there. You can see the larger um, electrode, um, this the sensing electrode on the cortical surface, the more direct, um, straighter lined electrode with the smaller contacts is the effector electrode, the DBS electrode. So it connects a DBS electrode to a sensing electrode through a processor, senses when you start to get epileptiform cranial activity, and then it will affect stimulation, which will abort the seizure. And that, that also has been very effective, but still a very gross design. Also, gastric electrical stimulation, hypoglossal nerve stimulation are things that have been done. There's a lot of different things to try, but um, 
But again, this is a field where just about anything you think you might want to do, you're going to be able to do if you have a good reason for it. And the technology is getting better and better to try new things out. But just to go around the horn on the pictures, the um, the upper picture with the man-like person is the vagal nerve stimulator. To the right is the DBS. Um, just below that is a standard spinal cord stimulator with the generator in the upper outer part of the buttock. And then over the spine in the lower thoracic area, uh, an electrode in the epidural space. Um, medial to that is the intrathecal pump. And you can see the pump itself, which is sort of hockey puck sized. And then the little intrathecal catheter that goes through the spinal fluid space. Lower left corner is the sacral nerve stimulation. And you see those little uh, electrodes down in the sacral nerve area hooked to the same kind of generator that you have for the spinal cord. Um, in the middle lower is the dorsal root ganglion electrodes that go right out the foramen along the dorsal root ganglion. And then, as I said, in the lower right. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.